I spent 10 years in the Marines, so when the agency reached out to me about joining their special activities center, it was a no-brainer. My name's Jared, by the way. The SAC is basically the CIA's paramilitary arm, the guys they send in when things go sideways somewhere, and they need someone to fix it fast. I've done more than a few tours with them all over the world. Places you wouldn't dream about on your worst day. But this last job? This one took the cake. A couple of months ago, they flew me and my partner, Silas, out to rural Georgia. Small town, nothing much on the map, some old paper mill that had gone out of business a decade back. Apparently, locals were talking about seeing lights inside the old mill at night. Now, on its own, that ain't much to go on. Folks in small towns get bored, make up stories. Happens all the time. But some congressman's buddy went missing around the same time. Dude was down visiting family in the area, car found parked at a trailhead that leads to a spot just outside the mill. Congressman raised a fuss, and before you know it, we're on a plane with orders to investigate discreetly. It's what the sender does, even if half the time it's bull. I'm not going to lie, landing in the middle of nowhere with nothing but rumors and a local cop's report, I wasn't exactly inspired, especially when it starts drizzling as we head for the site. I mean, who disappears from a trail at 2 p.m. on a Saturday, anyway? Silas just grinned and called me a city slicker. He was from some backwoods town in Alabama, so he thought this was prime entertainment. Now, the mill itself was, well, it was creepy. Abandoned buildings had a certain vibe, you know? This place was huge, half falling apart, all rust and cracked concrete. The trail led right to the loading docks, and sure enough, there were some freshish tire tracks pulling into the lot, ending in a mess of gravel where the asphalt gave out. The congressman's rental, they guessed. Inside was where it starts to get weird. I'm not a superstitious guy, but you know that feeling you get in your gut sometimes? Well, I got that the second we stepped in. Dark, dusty, that echoing silence, it was like the whole place was watching us. And the smell. Kinda damp and musty, with something like old iron underneath. We split up to cover more ground. The floor was a maze of catwalks and machinery, the only light coming in from grimy windows up high. It took us almost half an hour before Silas finally calls out my name from deeper inside the mill. I found him near a massive rusted tank that looked like it used to hold something nasty. Silas was all pale, like what he found shook him up good. Hey, I say, giving him a nudge. What did you find, man? He swallows, his voice quiet. This ain't right. I think, there are bones down there. Now, being ex-military, I've seen bodies, alright? But when you find a pile of human skeletons at the bottom of a rusty tank in an abandoned mill, it kinda gives you pause. We called it in, of course. Local cops got there first, then state troopers, and finally a swarm of agency suits. They secured the area, started taking photos, the whole nine yards. Turned out the bones belonged to five different people, all men. Things got even stranger the next day. Coroner's report showed one of the bodies was the congressman's buddy. Guy had been missing for about a week, looked like his neck had been snapped clean in two. Now, again, that's a hell of a way to go, but it happens. Mugging gone bad, drug deal, whatever. But the other four bodies? 
they raised a whole lot more questions than they answered. The coroner said she couldn't get a precise date of death, but the remains were in bad shape. Skeletonized, not on. Whatever killed those guys, it took its time eating them. She asked us, straight-faced, if there were any wild predators in the area that might do something like that. Silas and I looked at each other. Bears? Maybe a big one could snap a guy's neck, but it couldn't strip a body clean. Mountain lions? Way out of their normal range. We both shrugged, told her we didn't know what would explain it. The suits were giving us the stink I like this was our fault. That was when things got real serious. Turns out, those four John does weren't local to the area. They ID'd two as drifters passing through. But the last two? One of them was a missing hiker who disappeared about a year prior. And the other? Well, that's where things got really messed up. That body was a decade old, according to the coroner. Which, logically, it couldn't be, because that mill hadn't been abandoned for that long. I still get the shivers thinking about it. The agency pulled us from the job right after that. They said they'd send in their own specialists. Silas and I booked the first flight out the next morning. Silas was strangely quiet the whole flight back, just staring out the window. He kept mumbling something about his grandpa, old mountain stories. I figured he was just trying to puzzle it out, make sense of things. I wish I hadn't brushed it off so easily back then. See, a few weeks later, Silas started acting weird. Like, real weird. Always jumpy, looking over his shoulder. Quit eating right, said something was following him. I chalked it up to stress, tried to get him out to a bar blow off some steam. Didn't work. Eventually, Silas just disappeared. Vanished into thin air. The agency claimed he just up and quit, but I know better. Whatever was going on in that mill followed us back. I can't shake the feeling. The days blurred into a haze of paranoia. Sleep escaped me as nightmares of that rusted tank and gnawed bones haunted my every waking moment. I moved into a cheap motel on the outskirts of town, always on high alert, always looking for, well, I wasn't sure what exactly. Just something off, a shadow out of place. The agency tried playing it cool. They called occasionally to check in as if my ex-partner's disappearance was some minor inconvenience. I wanted to scream at them, demand they find Silas. But some part of me, deep down, knew they wouldn't. Because they had no idea what we'd uncovered back in Georgia. And that's when I started digging. It became an obsession. I spent every hour I wasn't jump-starting my crappy car at some rinky-dink library or scrolling through microfilm in dusty archives. Old missing persons reports, local legends, tales of weird critters lurking in the woods. Anything at all to explain what we'd seen at that mill. That's when I found it, whispered stories, passed down through generations in these parts. Talk of the Skinner, a thing that walked the woods in the shape of a man, but wasn't. A creature of hunger and bone that craved the living. It was insane, I knew that. Folk tales designed to scare kids at campfires. But every time I closed my eyes, I saw that pile of gnawed skeletons. I saw Silas's haunted face. I knew we weren't dealing with some random serial killer. The agency finally caught on to my little investigation. Some suit came knocking at my motel room door one night, 
asking questions like he knew something I didn't. He tried to downplay it, called it routine procedure for partner disappearances. I remember the way he smiled, a tight, practiced smile that never reached his eyes. I didn't trust him for a second. Next day, I packed up my meter belongings and hit the road. No point sticking around. I figured I could lay low, change my name, maybe find whatever this thing was before it found me. I had enough military training to give myself a fighting chance. The road twisted and turned for weeks, taking me further and further from Georgia. It was a lonely journey, haunted by the memories of the mill and Silas's panicked eyes. But somewhere between the truck stops and dingy motels, a sliver of determination hardened within me. I wouldn't hide. If I was going down, I'd go down swinging. I headed north, following the whispers of those old tales. They led me to the remote stretches of the Appalachians, where the mountains swallowed the sun early and the trees whispered secrets in the wind. It was beautiful and terrifying all at once. I rented a cabin on the edge of the wilderness, stocked up on supplies, and waited. It came on the third night. Not with a crash or a roar, but a silence deeper than the surrounding forest. The power went out first, plunging the cabin into darkness. I felt something shift outside, like a cold shadow had fallen across the moon. My hand closed around my gun, a comforting weight in the smothering darkness. My military instincts kicked in as I positioned myself in a defensible corner. I heard the soft tap of footsteps on the wooden porch outside, a slow, methodical rhythm that sent chills down my spine. And then it was at the window. I know because its eyes glowed through the darkness, two burning pinpricks of malevolent yellow. They were like nothing I'd ever seen, filled with an ancient, insatiable hunger. I couldn't make out much of its form, just a tall, hunched shape that somehow felt twisted and wrong. Whatever it was, it was big. It slammed into the window with a force that rattled the whole cabin. Glass shattered, and a long, clawed hand reached inside, scrabbling desperately. I fired, again and again, the gunshots echoing through the night. The creature howled, a piercing, inhuman screech, and then it retreated back into the shadows. I spent the rest of the night cowering in the corner, heart pounding so loud against my ribs that I was sure the creature could hear it. By dawn, the woods were silent again. I cautiously ventured outside, gun raised, expecting to find a trail of blood or some other sign of my battle. Nothing. Just the pristine beauty of the morning, untouched and serene. Like the whole thing had been a nightmare. Except for the shattered window, and the deep, gouging claw marks in the wall right beside where I'd been standing. The aftermath was a blur. I knew I couldn't stay. I gathered what little belongings I hadn't destroyed in my panic and abandoned the cabin with its broken window and clawed walls. As I drove back toward civilization, I kept checking the rearview mirror, expecting to see that burning gaze following me. I've drifted since then, never stopping for too long. The agency hasn't bothered me, and I like to think it's because they finally figured out what they're dealing with and even they can't touch it. Sometimes I try to push it all down, live a normal life. But it never lasts. The nightmares and the gnawing fear always find me. See, that old mountain tale wasn't completely wrong. It said the Skinner couldn't die. You could hurt it, drive it off, but eventually, it would find you again. Hungry and waiting. And somewhere out there, 
in the shadows beyond the city lights. I know it's still out there, and it's waiting. Okay, buckle up folks, because I've got another story that'll have you sleeping with the lights on. I'm Bennett, CIA, and last month I found myself smack dab in the middle of the West Virginia backwoods. Nestled in the heart of Appalachia, surrounded by dense forests and abandoned coal mines, was a town called Bramwell. Population, barely enough to flicker on a map. Turns out, Bramwell was hiding a nasty little secret. For months, people had been disappearing without a trace. Not just your average missing hiker, either. These were locals, seasoned hunters, even a park ranger. One by one, they vanished into those gnarly woods, leaving nothing behind but whispers and worried faces. The agency sent me and my partner, Torres, to investigate. Torres, she always reminded me of those tough, no-nonsense ladies from old detective movies. Me. I guess I'm more of the rumpled, cynical type, the one who's seen too much and sleeps too little. We hit the ground running, talking to the sheriff, interviewing families of the missing. Everyone was spooked, mumbling about curses and dark legends. This was Appalachian folklore territory, the kind of place where old superstitions run deep. But beneath the fear, I sensed something else, a collective hesitation. Like the whole town was holding back a truth they didn't want to say out loud. I could feel the tension, the way folks would look over their shoulders when we asked about the disappearances, like they expected the trees themselves to have ears. I wasn't sure if we were dealing with fear, or guilt, or something worse. We decided to head into the woods, scope out the area where most of the folks disappeared. It was everything you don't want in a wilderness, thick, tangled growth, steep ravines, and an uneasy silence broken only by the rustle of leaves and the occasional crow cawing way too loud. Even Taurus, for all her city slicker bravado, was getting the willies. We pushed deeper, following old game trails and keeping an eye out for, well, anything unusual. And that's when I saw it. At first, it was just a flash of movement against the dim green light filtering through the canopy. Then, I caught a glimpse of something hunched over what looked like. Jesus, I still try to convince myself it was just a deer carcass. But it wasn't. It was a body, what was left of one anyway, and it was half eaten. Before I could get a good look, the thing crouched on the body bolted. And that's when I got my first clear look at this monster. It was huge, bigger than any man, with long, bony limbs and gleaming gray skin stretched taut over its bones. It moved like a spider all jerky motions and inhuman speed. Its head. I can't even begin to describe the head. Imagine a wolf's snout, but stretched way too long, filled with rows of jagged teeth. Its eyes glowed with a pale yellow light, like embers in the dark. Taurus shouted, raising her gun, but the damn thing vanished. Just like that. Gone. But whatever it was, it wasn't natural. Not an animal I'd ever learned about in zoology class, that's for sure. We retreated back to town, both of us shaken to the core. The thing was out there, lurking in those woods, hunting people. Locals whispered about the bone stripper, some ancient spirit of the forest twisted with hunger. Torres brushed it off muttering about mass hysteria and mountain moonshine. But I wasn't so sure. I've seen things in my years with the agency, things that defy explanation. And this creature, it felt different. Primal. 
malignant. I convinced Taurus we needed to go back into the woods, set up some traps, infrared cameras, something. The sheriff, an old timer named Hank, gave us the reluctant go ahead. He was desperate, the missing persons piling up, the town gripped by fear. Funny, the things a good scare can make people do. That night, we trekked back into that eerie patch of wilderness, laden down with gear. As we set up the cameras, that bone-deep unease was prickling at the back of my neck. We were being watched. I knew it. Torres had set up a makeshift ground blind near a creek, some kind of game trail if the tracks we found were anything to go by. I was hunkered down in the trees opposite, my night vision binoculars trained on the blind waiting for our monster to show. The hours dragged on, and my nerves buzzed like a loose wire. The forest was alive with creaks and rustles, every shadow taking on a sinister shape. And then, on the infrared screen, I saw it. The creature materialized near the blind, slinking silently from the darkness. Its gaunt form was unmistakable, and my gut clenched. It didn't seem to sense Taurus. I held my breath. The creature crept closer, sniffing the air. For a moment, I got a clear look at its monstrous face, the glowing eyes fixed on the blind. It opened its maw, impossibly wide, and let loose a shriek that sent chills down my spine. The sound was unlike anything earthly, a piercing wail that echoed through the woods, laced with hunger and ancient malice. I knew I had to warn Torres, but shouting would only reveal our position. Frantically, I fumbled for my radio, trying to raise her, but the damn thing was dead. Static and garbled words were all I got in response, like the forest itself was messing with my signal. And then, Taurus screamed. A blood-curdling, desperate scream cut short. I saw movement inside the blind, a frantic scramble, then the infrared image flickered, and the screen went black. It happened so fast, I barely had time to register it. My heart pounded in my ears, a sick mixture of fear and rage surging through me. I was out of options. It was her or the creature, and I wasn't about to leave Taurus to die out there. Moving as quietly as I could, I edged down from my position, rifle raised. There was no more hiding, no more waiting. It was down to me against that thing, whatever it was. The moonlight was weak, filtering through the dense canopy in sparse patches as I stalked towards the makeshift blind. With each step, I half expected the creature to spring out at me from the darkness, its long limbs snatching me into the shadows. The creek was eerily quiet. Not even the chirp of a cricket. Just the echo of my own harsh breathing and the pounding of blood in my ears. I reached the blind, my skin prickling with dread. It was ripped apart, the material shredded, the ground trampled. All that remained was a splash of blood on the damp earth, and a smear of black gore on a torn piece of Torah's jacket. I forced myself to breathe, to focus, because I knew damn well that thing was still out there, watching. It was toying with me playing its cruel game. I scanned the darkness, trying to pick out any movement, any hint of the creature's presence. That's when I heard the whimper. It was faint, barely audible above the pounding of my own heart, coming from a cluster of bushes near the creek. Taurus. She was alive, or whatever the creature considered to be alive. I edged closer, rifle raised. In the pale moonlight, I saw a crumpled shape, barely moving. Taurus, her body torn and slick with blood. 
but what I saw next made my blood run cold. Looming over her, bathed in shadow, was the creature. It held something in its bony grasp, a long, dripping length of meat. Tora's leg. It gnawed hungrily, savoring the flesh. As it turned its head towards me, its glowing eyes narrowed. It was now or never. I raised my rifle and unleashed a barrage of bullets, the gunshots shattering the deathly silence of the woods. Each shot tore into the creature's leathery hide, sending spurts of black viscous fluid splattering across the dirt. But it didn't go down. It snarled in rage, a guttural, guttural sound, and its elongated jaw unhinged grotesquely. I kept firing, desperate and furious, tears blurring my vision. The creature flinched with each hit, but it was coming for me, its long limbs scrambling over the ground with terrifying speed. I stumbled back, tripping over a root, and felt a searing pain explode in my shoulder as the creature's bone-like claws raked across my skin. It was on me in a flash, its foul stench washing over me as it reared up. I braced myself for the killing blow, the sight of those jagged teeth descending towards me, and then, a shot rang out. And another. The creature let out a piercing shriek and stumbled, its attack halted. I blinked, stunned, to see Hank emerge from the darkness, his old hunting rifle clutched tight. He wasn't alone. A dozen figures stumbled out of the trees, the townsfolk of Bramwell, armed with shotguns, axes, anything they could get their hands on. They had heard the gunfire, seen the flashes. For once, their fear had been replaced with desperation, with a need to fight. The creature, outnumbered and wounded, turned tail and fled, scrambling back into the shadows with unnatural speed. Hank rushed to my side, helping me to my feet, son, you alright? I could barely answer, the pain throbbing in my shoulder and the shock numbing my senses. All I could think about was Torres, her mangled form lying there in the dirt. I didn't know if she was still alive, and a piece of me didn't want to know. The aftermath was a blur. Search parties scoured the woods, but found no sign of the creature. Torres died before the paramedics could arrive. I was treated and questioned, and eventually the agency sent a cleanup crew to sanitize the whole mess. Bramwell went back to being a sleepy mountain town, but the scars remained. Hank found me a week later, sitting outside the town diner, trying to draw my nightmares in cheap whiskey. He set a jar down in front of me, a murky liquid sloshing inside. Reckon this might help with the pain, he said, his voice gruff. Inside the jar, bobbing in some kind of homemade moonshine, was a gnarled, bony claw, severed at the wrist. Trophy, he grunted, meeting my gaze. Folks won't let the story die. They don't want to forget what happened. What that thing took from us. I took a swig of the fiery liquid, feeling the burn chase the chill from my bones. It didn't erase the horror, the guilt, but it was a start. Bramwell's bone stripper had become a legend, a cautionary tale whispered around campfires. The agency had covered it up, of course, but truth has a way of seeping out in these parts. As for me, I'm still with the agency. They don't quite know what to make of me anymore. After Bramwell, I'm more of a relic, a walking reminder that there are shadows even the government can't control. I take the solo assignments now, tracking things that slip through the cracks of our reality. I don't know if I'll ever find peace. I'm not sure I deserve it. But out there, in the wild places and the darkened corners of the world, there are monsters. 
and as long as they lurk, as long as they hunt, someone needs to hunt them back. I was tracking those missing campers in the Ozarks. See, there's this stretch of gnarled backwoods folks mostly stick clear of. Word is, people vanish there and I don't mean the walk off the straight and narrow kind. Agency types usually scoff at local superstition, but my gut said this was different. Call me Jonas, by the way. Been with the company so long, I feel more at home in classified docs than I do in my own skin sometimes. The first two days were uneventful. Standard wilderness recon, soggy boots, snapping twigs, the usual symphony of woodland critters. Then, on the third night, things got real weird. I woke to an unholy racket, a low guttural growl that echoed through the hollows. My first thought was a bear, but something felt off. This wasn't your average foraging beast. By the time I located the source, dawn was just starting to paint the sky. I found the campers, or what was left of them. The clearing looked like a hurricane had torn through it, tents shredded, supplies scattered, and blood, so much blood. The bodies, Christ, I won't go into the details. Let's just say, no animal I'd ever seen could do something like that. Something big was lurking in those woods, something vicious. Training took over. I examined the scene, teeth gritted against the nausea rising in my throat. It had rained the previous night, the ground soft in patches, perfect for tracks. And there they were, massive paw prints unlike any bear or mountain lion. These were wrong. Grotesque. The thing moved on two legs, but the claws, they hinted at something more agile, more adept at climbing than your standard apex predator. I spent that day gathering intel from the nearby town, some backwater hole in the map clinging to existence with a rusty gas station and a diner where everyone knows your name. Locals didn't say much, just exchanged uneasy glances and muttered about the old ways about things best left alone. Got the distinct impression I wasn't the first government suit asking questions they didn't want to answer. Finally, cornered an old-timer named Ezra, hunched over his coffee like a prophet of doom. They call it the Howler, he rasped, roomy eyes darting towards the treeline. Ain't a natural creature. Some kind of spirit. He trailed off, the word spirit hanging heavy in the thick diner air. I tried to pry more info, but the old man clammed up, leaving me with half-whispered stories and a creeping sense of unease. Now, I'm a man of logic and hard evidence. But out there, alone in the heart of those ancient hills, even my ingrained skepticism felt thin, brittle. It was getting dark time to move. With a sigh, I shouldered my pack, a glance at the lowering sun telling me I'd be hiking under the cover of night. Bad call. Turns out, the Ozark woods at night play by their own set of rules. The familiar sounds of the forest were drowned out by an oppressive silence. No crickets, no rustling leaves, even the owls seemed to have vanished. My flashlight beam cut a pathetic tunnel through the inky blackness. Every creaking branch had me whirling around, gun drawn. My nerves were buzzing like a hornet's nest. And then I heard it, the howler's call. A deep moaning sound, rising and falling in a mournful wail that vibrated straight through to my bones. It echoed through the woods, seeming to come from every direction at once. Then, silence again. The next few hours were a blur of adrenaline and stumbling progress. The creature was tracking me, 
I was sure of it. I caught glimpses out of the corner of my eye, a flash of matted fur, a hulking shape disappearing between the trees as soon as I focused my light. The forest had become a claustrophobic prison, the unseen eyes of the howler boring into me. Finally, exhausted and soaked with cold sweat, I made a desperate decision. I found a moss-covered rock formation, a tight overhang that offered some meager concealment. Wedging myself into the space, I killed my flashlight, plunging myself into absolute darkness. Maybe, just maybe, it would pass me by. I lay there, heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs, listening to the rustling silence of the woods. And then, soft footsteps, moving with impossible grace for something of its size. The footsteps stopped right outside my hiding spot and I held my breath. A rancid odor, like rotting meat and wet animal fur, filled the space. The howler was close enough for me to hear its ragged breathing. I lay frozen, every muscle screaming in protest. If it found me, well, let's just say the fate of those campers was looking downright pleasant in comparison. Time lost all meaning in that suffocating darkness. Was it waiting for me to make a move? Studying me? Lord knows I wasn't studying it. I squeezed shut, fighting the almost overwhelming urge to scream and bolt into the night. Then, as abruptly as it had started, the rancid smell and oppressive silence vanished. Hesitantly, I cracked open an eye. Nothing but inky blackness. Had it moved on, or was this some sadistic game? I waited, minutes ticking by an agonizing slow motion until my cramped limbs and protesting bladder forced me to make a choice, certain death or painfully uncomfortable discovery. With a silent curse, I flicked on the flashlight, the beam cutting through the darkness. No sign of the howler. My relief was short-lived. Something was different. The forest floor, normally a tangle of roots and decaying leaves, was eerily smooth. And then I saw them, footprints, the same grotesque clawed imprints I'd found at the campsite. Only this time, they were fresh, the mud still damp. The howler was close, and it was heading right where I didn't want to go, back towards the direction of town. Ice water dripped down my spine. Those folks in the diner, with their uneasy glances and cryptic warnings, they weren't just scared of the creature, they were scared for themselves. I started running, clumsily at first as my stiff muscles protested, then with the desperate energy of the hunted. The flashlight beam bounced crazily, half illuminating the path ahead with each jarring step. If the howler had been playing with me before, that was over. Now it was in a full-on chase, its eerie howls closer with each ragged breath I took. Stumbling out of the treeline, the sight of the old gas station felt like salvation. Blinded by tears of panic and the glare of the harsh fluorescent lights, I slammed into the diner, a desperate, half-crazed figure, shouting incoherent warnings. Folks at the counter jumped, faces turning pale. Then, Ezra, old Ezra with his haunted eyes, was there, steadying me, a surprising strength in his withered hands. It's here, I choked out, collapsing against a sticky vinyl booth. The howler, it's. The words died in my throat as a scream tore through the night. Not the howler's mournful cry, but a human scream, choked off in raw terror. We all surged to the windows as one. In the flickering half-light cast by the old neon sign, a monstrous shape was rampaging through the parking lot. It ripped into a rusty old pickup with terrifying ease, the metal screeching in protest. Another scream, shorter this time, 
cut off with gruesome finality. Ezra turned towards me, his face etched with grim resignation. Never made it to our town before, he said, his voice low and heavy. Not till now. A wave of gut-wrenching nausea washed over me. It wasn't just hunting anymore, this was an attack. We gotta warn people, I gasped, fumbling for my phone. No signal. Of course. We were alone. Outside, the howler was surveying its handiwork, the light glinting off its matted coat, its eyes glowing like fiery pits in the half-light. Then, it turned its massive head towards the diner and let out a blood-curdling howl that rattled the windows. We were next. Ezra was already moving, a man propelled by a lifetime of ingrained survival instincts. Back door, he barked, herding the terrified patrons towards the kitchen. A hunting rifle was propped casually behind the counter, of course there was a rifle. Ezra snatched it up, his movements surprisingly sure for his age. I hesitated, torn between fight and flight. In the end, duty, or maybe just bone-deep stubbornness, won out. Snatching up the discarded keys to the agency SUV I'd stashed behind the gas station, I sprinted outside, fumbling for the button that would set off the alarm. The sound felt deafening in the silent night, and it did its job. The howler turned, its focus shifting from the diner to me. With a roar that shook the ground, it charged. I sprinted for the SUV, praying the damn thing would start. It sputtered to life just as the howler reached me, its claws raking across the tailgate, leaving deep gouges in the metal. I threw the SUV into gear and peeled out, watching in the rearview mirror as it crashed through the diner windows. Gunshots echoed as the howler's howls of rage mingled with the terrified screams of the people trapped inside. Barreling down the winding road, the aftermath played out in my head in horrifying detail. Ezra, buying precious time with that old rifle. The inevitable slaughter, it was on me. My foot slammed down on the gas pedal, the SUV protesting the abuse as I pushed it to its limits. The nearest town with a proper police force was at least 40 minutes away. Even if they believed my frantic story, it would be too late for Ezra and the others. It was a doomed, desperate drive, fueled by guilt, terror, and a sliver of desperate hope. I have no idea how I made it to town in one piece. Recounting the story at the sheriff's station was a nightmare blur of disbelieving stares, repeated explanations and the gnawing fear with each passing second. Finally, sirens wailed in the distance as backup arrived, local cops, state troopers, even a few nervous-looking feds who clearly got the classified alert about who I really worked for. The drive back was excruciating, the tension a near-physical thing in the car. Reaching the outskirts of town, we were met by an eerily glowing sight. The diner was ablaze, flames licking at the night sky. Ezra, the townsfolk, part of me already knew their fate. The howler was gone, vanished back into the wilderness. We'd find the remains eventually, mangled and torn, just like those campers. Another unsolved mystery, another local tragedy to be whispered about in hushed tones. Let me tell you, folks, there was a time I thought I'd seen it all with the agency. From tracking down defectors in seedy Warsaw hotels to infiltrating arms deals in the back alleys of Istanbul, you name it, I've probably got a story about it that'll curl your toes. But nothing, and I mean nothing, prepared me for those woods in the deep backcountry of Maine. Call me Deacon, by the way. 
I'm the guy they send in when things go sideways, the fixer. Turns out, Maine had gone more than sideways. It had fallen off the map and into a damn nightmare. See, the locals called it the tether, this ancient stretch of forest nestled between the mountains, where the trees grew close and the shadows didn't budge, even under the noonday sun. Place gives you the creeps, I swear. Word was, people kept disappearing up there. Hikers, the occasional unlucky hunter. Nobody ever came back, not so much as a boot or a scrap of bloody clothing. The state police thought it was bears, wild animal attacks. The locals, they weren't so sure. They whispered old stories, tales of a creature lurking in the tether. Some folks called it the Shrike, a hunched, twisted thing with a hunger for the living. Townies up there, they keep to themselves, but the fear was clear in their eyes. You get a feeling for those things, after a while. The agency sent me and my partner, Morales, to check it out. Locals disappearing on United States soil? Now that raises some eyebrows, let me tell you. Morales, he was ex-Marine. Big guy, built like a tank and twice as reliable. Me, I'm more the brains of the operation, I suppose. We flew up to some tiny regional airport in a beat-up old prop plane, rented a truck, and made our way into the heart of that godforsaken forest. We set up camp at the edge of the tether, figuring we'd do some recon before venturing in. Now, I'll admit, I had my doubts about the whole Shrike business. Folklore, right? But out there, listening to the trees groan and those godawful crows squawking in the distance, a sliver of unease settled down my spine. Morales was all business, though. He set up infrared cameras on the tree line, motion detectors rigged all around. If something's out there, he grunted, squinting through his night vision binoculars, we'll find it. That was Morales for you, always so damn sure. Night fell, heavy and thick as molasses. The forest went deathly quiet, not even the usual crickets chirping. That kind of silence ain't natural, not a good kind. I sat huddled by the campfire, rifle close, my eyes scanning the darkness. Every rustle, every snap of a twig, had me jumping. Morales was snoring in the tent, dead to the world. I should have envied the bastard, because I sure as hell couldn't sleep. Then, I heard it. A low guttural growl that echoed through the trees, sending shivers down my spine. Not an animal I recognized. My heart pounded like a war drum. And that's when I saw the eyes. Two glowing embers, burning in the darkness, way too high up for any deer or bear. They moved slowly closer, blinking in and out of sight between the gnarled trunks. I scrambled to wake up Morales, whispering a frantic curse as he stumbled out of the tent, still bleary-eyed. The eyes were closer now. What the hell is that? Morales hissed, reaching for his sidearm. Before I could answer, the creature emerged from the shadows. My blood ran cold. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. Tall, at least seven feet, its body hunched and misshapen, its skin a mottled, leathery gray. Its head, dear God, the head. Like a bird of prey, but stretched and monstrous, with a beak lined with jagged teeth. Its eyes, those glowing embers, stared out hungrily. Get the infrared, I snapped at Morales, my voice raspy with terror. He fumbled with his gear, trying to find the camera. But the creature was already moving. 
It blurred across the ground with unnatural speed, its long, clawed limbs propelling it forward. Morales never even had a chance to scream. The creature was on him, a screeching whirlwind of teeth and claws. I heard the wet rip of flesh, the crack of bone, and a strangled gurgle that cut off abruptly. I fired blindly into the darkness, the gunshots echoing through the trees. Then I was running, crashing through the undergrowth, the creature's rasping howls close behind me. I didn't stop, didn't dare look back. Branches whipped my face, thorns tore at my skin, but I kept going, fueled by pure terror. I burst from the tree line, stumbling onto a dirt road. In the faint dawn light, I saw my truck parked a short distance away. Salvation. Or so I thought. As I ran towards the truck, my heart sank. The driver's side door was hanging open, the interior smeared with blood. Morales was gone, dragged into the forest by that beast. I slammed the door shut, fumbling with the keys. The creature's screeches were getting closer. It was circling the truck, looking for a way in. I shoved the key into the ignition, the engine roaring to life. Gravel flew as I slammed the truck into gear and peeled away, the creature's howl fading into the distance. I didn't stop driving until I hit the nearest town, a sleepy little place with a diner and a flickering neon motel sign. The diner waitress had eyes as big as saucers when I stumbled in, clothes torn, face streaked with dirt and sweat. I ordered coffee, black, and about a gallon of it, then sunk into a cracked vinyl booth, my hands trembling. Every creak of the floorboards, every flicker of the fluorescent lights, had me jumping. I had to call it in, had to report back to the agency. But how the hell was I supposed to explain what happened out there? Giant, killer bird monster ate my partner, yeah, that'd go over real well back at Langley. Still, no choice. I found a battered payphone, fumbled for some change, and dialed HQ. The line crackled with static. Finally, a familiar voice barked, identify yourself, agent. It's Deacon. I'm in Maine. Morales is. I choked on the words, the image of his mangled body flashing before my eyes. Morales is Kia. We were ambushed. By something. Not human. There was silence on the other end of the line. Repeat that, Deacon. I did my voice tight. Told them about the creature, the glowing eyes, how it moved like a damn blur. Told them how I barely got away. When I finished, the silence stretched even longer. Get to the nearest safe house, the voice finally said, crisp and clipped. Wait for extraction. We'll send a cleanup crew. And that was that. Like Morales was nothing more than a broken broom, the monster just a bad dream. Just another day in the life of a damn agency spook, I suppose. Safe House was a bunker-like cabin tucked away in the woods, the kind of place that didn't exist on any map. Had everything I needed, burner phone, encrypted laptop, a small arsenal. I hold up there trying to piece together what the hell I'd faced back in that forest. Turns out, the locals weren't too far off with their stories. Found some references to the Shrike in old historical texts, scraps of Native American folklore. Turns out this thing wasn't some new mutation, it was ancient, a malevolent spirit tied to the tether. Some legends claimed it was a protector of the forest, others a guardian of an even older evil buried deep within the woods. 
One thing was consistent, the damn thing was ravenous, a hunter of the living. The agency extraction team arrived a few days later. Clean-cut suits and sterile smiles, like they were there for a corporate retreat, not to sanitize a bloodbath. They asked questions, ran their tests, then packed up their gear and left me staring at the empty cabin. Before they departed, the lead suit tossed me a file. Incident reclassified, he said, his voice flat. Missing hikers blamed on bear attacks, standard cover story in place. Your report will be filed accordingly. Typical agency bullshit. Bury the truth, sweep the monster under the rug. I wanted to scream, to tell them they couldn't just leave this thing out there, hunting, killing. But I knew it was no use. They saw the world in statistics not lives. Morales was just a casualty, the creature an unacceptable anomaly. The aftermath gnaws at me. I left the agency soon after. Couldn't stomach their lies, their cold calculations. Took a job as a security consultant, a fancy name for a glorified bodyguard. But it ain't the same. You don't forget those woods, the feel of real fear seeping into your bones. Sometimes, late at night, I think I hear those glowing eyes scratching at my window, that rasping howl echoing in the wind. Every now and then, I think about going back to Maine. Maybe the locals still tell stories around their campfires, stories about the man who faced the Shrike and lived. We could band together, hunters and survivors, maybe even find a way to stop the creature, end its reign of terror. But then I think of Morales, of the look on his face when that thing came out of the darkness. That mix of confusion and pure, gut-wrenching fear. I think about the others it must have taken, their screams fading into the silence of the tether. And I can't just walk away. The other night, I started packing. Rifle, ammo, survival gear. Had a beat up old truck all gassed up and ready to go. Glanced at the map, tracing a route back to those godforsaken woods in Maine. I'm under no illusions. I'm probably walking into my own grave. But damn it, I can't live with myself knowing that thing is still out there lurking in the shadows. Some battles you can't win. Some monsters you can't bury. But the least I can do is try. I owe it to Morales, and to all those who never came out of the tether. Maybe I'll die out there, just another name whispered in fear around the locals' campfires. Or maybe, just maybe, I'll come back with the head of the Shrike mounted on the hood of my truck. Either way, it's time to finish what we started in those damn woods. Okay, buckle up folks, because I've got a hell of a story from my last assignment down in Louisiana, just outside a little town called Abbeville. I'm Braden, by the way. Been with the agency for a while now mostly running down leads on foreign assets. This mission, though, it was way outside my normal wheelhouse. See, we got a tip about some disappearances in this marshy, backwater part of the state. Three hikers gone missing in less than a year, all from the same trail network. Locals blamed everything from gators to escaped convicts, but nothing ever panned out. Agency figured, well, missing Americans, that's our jurisdiction. So, they sent me down to partner with a fish and wildlife agent named Katie, supposedly the resident expert on the area. Katie, let me tell you, this woman was a trip. Louisiana born and bred, she'd grown up hearing all the old stories about things that lurked in the swamps. 
didn't mean she believed them, necessarily, but her grandpa swore there was more out there than your average mosquitoes and snapping turtles. Me, I'm a city boy. Don't get me wrong, I've done some wilderness survival training, but this place? It was on a whole other level. Those marshlands, they felt like another world, all tangled vines and stagnant water, the air thick as soup. We spent a couple days combing through the area where the hikers vanished. Nothing. Now to trace. Found some gator scat that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck, but that's about the extent of our wildlife encounter. Now, Katie knew these parts way better than me. After a while, you start to sense the rhythm of a place, you know? The noises, the flow of the land. Katie had that in spades. It was on the third day, nearing dusk, when she suddenly froze, her hands snapping out to quiet me. Something's not right, she breathed, her voice barely a whisper. I tensed up, scanning the tree line. That feeling was starting to creep in on me too, that bone-deep sense of being watched. But whatever it was, it was keeping itself well hidden. We waited, watching as the sun dipped below the horizon and shadows stretched long over the swamp. Just when I started to think maybe Katie was mistaken, we heard it. It started with a click. One solitary, sharp click, like dry branches snapping. Then another. And another. Coming from all around us, getting closer, echoing in the humid air. Something was out there, circling us, and it was big. My brain threw up possible animal sounds, deer hooves, a bear maybe, but none of them quite fit. Katie inched backwards her hand slowly moving towards the pistol at her hip. I drew mine too, heart pounding so hard I felt it might burst out of my chest. That was when I saw it. Just a glimpse out of the corner of my eye, a flash of movement between two gnarled cypress trees. It was hunched low to the ground, its shape long and sinuous, but somehow bulky too. I couldn't make out details, but it moved with unnatural speed, its limbs blurring as it stalked us. A low growl rolled through the undergrowth, a deep, raspy sound that made my blood run cold. This wasn't a predator I recognized. We were being hunted by something else, something unknown. We gotta move, Katie hissed already backing away towards a break in the trees that I hoped led back towards the road. But every instinct in my body screamed at me to stand my ground, to open fire on whatever this thing was. I hesitated, and in that moment of indecision, it struck. It burst out of the undergrowth with impossible speed, a blur of sinewy muscle and gleaming claws. Katie yelled, firing off a shot, then another. Her bullet seemed to barely slow it down. The thing slammed into her, knocking her clean off her feet. I saw a flash of teeth, heard Katie's scream cut short, and then an awful spattering sound. My training kicked in. I emptied my clip into the creature, aiming for what I thought might be its torso. It roared, a monstrous, inhuman shriek, and staggered. I didn't wait to see if it would fall. I turned and ran, crashing through the swamp, branches whipping my face, my breath rasping in my throat. The thing was behind me, its enraged howl setting my teeth on edge. I don't know how long I ran. I just kept going, driven by pure terror. The creature's cries seemed to fade, but I could still feel those eyes on my back, burning with a malevolent hunger. Eventually, I stumbled out onto the road, collapsing to catch my breath. My legs were on fire, my lungs burned, 
and Katie's blood was smeared on my hands. The agency descended on Abbeville like a swarm of vultures. They pulled my battered body out of the swamp, whisked me off for debriefing, and then promptly slapped a gag order on the whole thing. Whatever that creature was, it wasn't something the American public was supposed to know about. They tried to pin Katie's death on a gator, some wild animal attack gone wrong. But I knew better. Even as I lay hooked up to an four in the sterile confines of a government safe house, I could still picture those glowing eyes, that flash of monstrous teeth. I was a mess after that, physically and mentally. The nightmares came every night, a relentless loop of Katie's scream and the creature's rasping growl. After a month, the agency gave me the boot unfit for duty or some such bureaucratic nonsense. I should have argued, fought them, but something inside me had broken that day in the swamp. I ended up drifting. Took a series of odd jobs trying to bury the memories. Bartender, security guard, even a stint working as a night watchman at a rural museum. That one almost finished me off, I swear. Every rustle, every shadow flickering on an exhibit case, it sent me spiraling. I didn't last more than a few weeks. The problem is, once you catch a glimpse behind the curtain, you can't pretend it's not there anymore. The average person goes about their day thinking the world is safe, predictable. There's comfort in that. After what I saw, that comfort was gone. So, I did what any washed up, paranoid ex-agent with a death wish would do. I went back. Not to Louisiana, not to that damned swamp. But to places like it. Small towns nestled near stretches of untouched wilderness, the kind where people still lock there. Doors at night because they trust the darkness. Places where you can almost believe the old stories might be true. I'd roll into town, asking questions, digging into old archives and local lore. Missing persons, strange sightings, anything that sent a shiver down the spine. Most times it came to nothing. Overactive imaginations and tall tales fueled by too much moonshine. But every now and then, I'd hit a place where that uneasy feeling settled in again. Where the stories had a ring of ugly truth to them. It's been five years since Louisiana. I've tracked things across the country hunched, furtive creatures sighted in the deep woods of Maine, eerie lights flickering near an abandoned mine shaft in Nevada, a whole community in Wisconsin plagued by disappearances that the police couldn't explain. Nothing as monstrous as the creature in the swamp, but all with that same touch of the uncanny, the otherworldly. I started making notes, compiling accounts, even sketching the things I'd seen when sleep was impossible. It's a morbid hobby, I know. But somebody's got to bear witness, even if nobody believes them. Maybe someone, someday, will be able to connect the dots I couldn't. The hunt has become an obsession, a way to try and outrun the guilt over Katie, the constant fear gnawing at my gut. People see me now, they don't see a haunted ex-agent. They see a rambling drifter, a conspiracy nut with a head full of ghost stories. Maybe they're right. Sometimes even I wonder about my own sanity. But the other night, I had that dream again. The swamp, the clicking sounds, Katie's eyes wide with terror. I woke with a jolt, heart pounding. I knew I wouldn't get back to sleep. Stumbling into the bathroom, I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror and almost recoiled. The face staring back was lined, haunted. Hair streaked with gray, eyes shadowed with a weariness far beyond my ears. 
Even through the haze of exhaustion, I could see it. I was becoming the creature I chased. Every encounter, every brush with the unknown, had chipped away at me, blurred the line between hunter and hunted. That was when I made the decision. This next job, it'll be the last. Win or lose, I'm done after this. I found a lead up in the Pacific Northwest. Word of some beast terrorizing a logging camp, dragging men off into the night. Sounds gruesome, and it has that familiar ring to it, isolated, on the edge of a vast, untamed wilderness. It's tailor-made for the kind of thing I've become too good at finding. I'm packing my gear now, a battered duffel bag filled with the meager tools of my trade. A pistol, a few silver rounds, you never know, a camera to document whatever fresh hell I walk into. There are whispers among the old-timers in these parts, stories about the Wendigo, a spirit of hunger that takes on monstrous form. Superstition probably, but then again, that's what I used to think about the creature in Louisiana too. I leave tomorrow. No illusions this time, no pretenses about saving anyone. This is my reckoning, one way or another. Maybe I'll finally bag myself a monster. But I think, more likely, I'm walking straight into my own oblivion. And somehow, after all this, that feels almost like peace. I stumbled off that bus in the heart of rural Idaho feeling more like a wounded animal than a CIA operative. Two weeks undercover with a backwoods militia group had taken its toll. Those guys were a whole different breed, survivalists, conspiracy theorists, and enough weaponry to arm a small country. Turns out the militia weren't the real problem, though. It was something lurking in the woods. Something the locals only whispered about. The Shriker, they called it. Name's Carter, by the way. Been with the agency long enough to see some things that would make your hair stand on end. But this, this was on another level. I infiltrated the militia group after picking up chatter about them preparing for a confrontation in some national forest land just north of Boise. They believed the government was hiding something out there, some secret facility or weapon. Turns out, reality was stranger, and far deadlier, than their wildest theories. The night it happened, tension in the militia camp was thick enough to choke on. Their leader, a grizzled old bastard named Jericho, had been ranting about how they were watching, how the final battle was about to begin. We were deep in the forest, miles from any civilization, surrounded by towering Douglas firs and a thick undergrowth that always seemed to be rustling, even without a breeze. That rustling started to get louder as darkness fell. The militiamen hunkered down, eyes wide, weapons at the ready. Then, the first scream tore through the night. It was a blood-curdling sound, a mix of pain and inhuman rage. And then we saw it. The Shriker, it was like something out of a nightmare. Massive, at least seven feet tall, with a body contorted into a gruesome parody of a bird. Its skin had a mottled, bark-like texture, and its head was all beak and gleaming eyes, not yellow or red, but a strange, milky white that seemed to glow from within. The thing descended on the camp in a blur of claws and teeth a whirlwind of violence. The militiamen fought back, emptying their magazines into the creature. But it barely seemed to slow down. It ripped through them with terrifying ease, its beak tearing through flesh, its talons shredding limbs. Jericho tried to rally his men, shouting some nonsense about fighting for freedom, but his voice was cut off as the Shriker clamped its beak around his head 
crushing it like an eggshell. I was paralyzed for a moment, pure terror gripping me. Then, training kicked in. I turned and ran, crashing through the undergrowth, the creature's rasping screeches echoing behind me. I ran blindly, branches whipping my face, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I couldn't shake the image of those milky white eyes, the dripping beak splattered with Jericho's blood, and the screams of the dying. Stumbling out onto a dirt track, luck finally sided with me. An old pickup truck came rattling down the road, headlights cutting through the gloom. I waved frantically, almost getting myself run over in the process. The driver, an old rancher type with a shotgun slung across his lap, slammed on the brakes. What in the hell are you doing out here, son? He barked, squinting at me through the darkness. I must have looked like a madman, eyes wide, covered in scratches. There's, there's something in the woods, I stammered, breathless. It killed everyone. The rancher exchanged a worried look with his wife. These parts, they have their own share of darkness. Tales pass through generations, whispers around dying campfires. They knew what lived in the shadows of those trees. Come on up then, the rancher grunted, resignation in his voice. We ain't leaving you for that thing. I scrambled into the truck barely breathing a sigh of relief before it lurched forward, headlights cutting a path through the darkness. As the truck sped down the winding forest road, the rancher reached back and handed me the shotgun. Here, he said, his voice grim. You might need this more than me. I took the weapon, its cold weight reassuring in my hands. Looking out the window, I saw the dense trees flashing past. In those dark woods, something monstrous was still lurking. Something hungry. Something that had tasted blood. We reached the ranch just before dawn, a sprawling homestead nestled in a clearing with a battered barn and a faded American flag flapping from a pole. The rancher, whose name I learned was Elias, and his wife Sarah, were grim, but welcoming. They brewed strong coffee and patched me up as best they could. I told my story over steaming mugs, the words tumbling out of me. I told them about the militia, about the Shriker, about the massacre in the woods. Elias and Sarah listened, their faces grave. When I finished, silence hung heavy in the air. Ain't the first time the Shriker's taken lives, Elias muttered, rubbing his weathered brow. Folks mostly leave it alone, give it a wide berth, but sometimes, sometimes it gets a hunger that needs satisfying. Sarah shot him a warning look. Boy seen enough for one night. He needs rest. They settled me into a spare room its worn blankets a poor substitute for the adrenaline coursing through my veins. Images of the attack, of the Shriker's gruesome form, flashed through my mind. Sleep was a long way off. I awoke to the sounds of the ranch stirring to life, chickens clucking, a distant tractor sputtering, the smell of wood smoke drifting in through the window. For a brief moment, it felt almost normal, a slice of rural life untainted by the horror I had witnessed. That illusion shattered when Elias poked his head into the room. Sheriff wants a word with you, son, he said, his expression troubled. Down in the kitchen. The sheriff, a stern, no-nonsense woman named Ellis, was sipping coffee at the kitchen table when I entered. She eyed me intently her gaze landing on the ragged bandage covering a gash on my arm. Elias here says you got a story to tell, she said, her voice flat and suspicious. Start talking. I gritted my teeth. 
another interrogation. But who was I going to tell the truth to? That a CIA agent got his ass handed to him by a mythical bird creature from a backwoods horror story? I settled on a heavily redacted version, the militia group, the ambush, me barely escaping with my life. Sheriff Ellis listened, her skepticism clear, but there wasn't much she could do. No bodies, no evidence, just the ramblings of a wild-eyed stranger. I spent the next few days at the ranch, an odd limbo between my old life and the nightmare I couldn't shake. Elias and Sarah were kind, offering food and shelter, but the unspoken tension crackled in the air. They knew I wasn't telling the whole truth. They knew about the Shriker, its bloody legacy woven into the fabric of this place. One afternoon, Elias found me staring into the woods that bordered the ranch. That thing's still on your mind, boy, he asked gruffly. How do you live with it? I asked, turning to face him. Knowing there's a, a monster out there. Elias shrugged, a flicker of pain in his eyes. We've lost folks over the years. Hunters, the occasional fool who wanders in too deep. You learn to respect the woods, to know what parts ain't yours to walk in. The Shriker, it's part of these lands, just like the bears and the wolves. But it ain't natural, I protested. It's... Some things ain't meant to be explained, Elias said, his voice final. You city folk, you think you can understand it all, control it all. Out here, there's forces older than your fancy government and fancier guns. His words hit me hard. I had always prided myself on my logic, my training, my ability to dissect any threat. But the Shriker defied all that. It was a primal, unknowable force that lurked just beyond the reach of reason. The aftermath was a mess, as these things usually are. I left Elias and Sarah's ranch with a fresh set of clothes and a vague promise to send help. A sanitized report filled with lies and half-truths was filed with the agency. The militia and the massacre were blamed on a drug deal gone wrong a convenient cover-up to sweep the Shriker under the rug. My superiors gave me a pat on the back and a two-week mandatory leave to get my head straight. But I couldn't shake it. The Shriker haunted my dreams, its milky eyes burning into my soul. I started drinking too much, trying to numb the memories, the images of those militiamen being torn apart. The agency offered counseling, a shrink to assure me it wasn't my fault, that I had done everything I could. It was all lies. I knew the truth. There was evil in those woods, and it was still out there, waiting, hungry. One sleepless night, fueled by whiskey and desperation, I made a decision. I packed a bag, filled my old truck with supplies and headed back towards Idaho. The agency could brand me a rogue agent, a madman, I didn't care. I wasn't going to hide while innocent people could be the Shriker's next victims. Driving down that winding forest road again, I felt a grim determination settling over me. I wasn't the same agent who had stumbled into that militia camp. I was a man on a mission, fueled by guilt, by rage, by a sliver of hope that maybe, just maybe, I could stop the creature. I contacted Elias, my voice ragged when I called from a payphone in a dusty gas station. He didn't sound surprised to hear from me. Figured you might be back, he said, a resigned sigh in his voice. The Shriker always calls those who've seen it back for another taste.
I was back in those damn woods, standing near the shores of a lonely mountain lake in Montana. Never thought I'd miss the bleak stench of a city, but after the things I had seen, those grimy streets felt almost comforting. Call me Langley, by the way. Been with the agency long enough that my real name is mostly a forgotten luxury. This op was different from day one. No clandestine briefings in shadowy safe houses, no sterile files detailing my target. My orders came straight from the top, whispered in a hushed phone call, the director's voice laced with an urgency I'd never heard before. Montana. Missing persons. Locals are spooked. Discreet. Deniable. Handle it. Now, I've dealt with some weird stuff in my time. But missing persons usually means cartel business or disgruntled ex-lovers. Not in this place. Whispers in the local tavern hinted at something darker. Woods off limits, stories of those who didn't come back, their faces etched with terror before they vanished. Locals blamed it on the Wendigo, an old Native American legend, a spirit of hunger and insatiable cold that haunted the wilderness. Dismissed it as folklore at first. Should have known better. I spent the first few days scouting the area, posing as a hiker. The lake was eerily beautiful, surrounded by dense pines that seemed to close in on you, the silence heavy and oppressive. Locals skirted wide around the place, fear hanging heavy in their eyes when I asked questions. Found a few abandoned campsites, ripped tents, scattered belongings, no bodies, no signs of struggle, just an unsettling feeling that folks weren't so much taken as erased. One evening, as the sun dipped below the jagged mountain peaks, I saw movement near the tree line. Humanoid, but twisted, all elongated limbs and jerky motions. It moved with unnatural speed, slinking in and out of the shadows, then, gone. A chill ran down my spine that had nothing to do with the mountain air. That was no animal, it was watching me. The next morning, I geared up. Standard field kit, plus a few, unofficial additions. Silver rounds for the pistol, old hunter's superstition about certain creatures. A wicked-looking hunting knife inherited from my grandfather, who fought in some hellish Pacific jungle back in 44. He swore by his blade. Figured it couldn't hurt. I spent hours tracking the thing through the backwoods. Each rustle of leaves, each snap of a twig, had me whirling around, gun raised. The forest was playing tricks on my mind, twisting every shadow into monstrous shapes. By nightfall, I was exhausted, nerve shot. I found a clearing near the lake, made a small fire, and tried to get some rest. Sleep was a no-go. The darkness pulsed with an unnatural chill, a prickling sensation on the back of my neck. And through the trees, eyes. Two faintly glowing orbs staring at me with hungry intent. I scrambled to my feet, the fire casting wild, dancing shadows as the creature emerged from the undergrowth. It was unlike anything I'd ever encountered. Tall, at least eight feet, its skeletal frame was draped in leathery, mottled gray skin. Its head was like a monstrous, twisted bird skull with teeth gleaming in the firelight. But those eyes, they burned with a chilling, inhuman intelligence. This was no mindless beast. It lunged. I barely raised my gun in time firing off shots that echoed through the silent forest. The creature let out an ear-splitting shriek, a sound that seemed to pierce my very soul. I kept firing, the silver rounds tearing into its flesh, 
but it barely slowed. It knocked the gun from my hand and charged, its razor claws outstretched. I dove for my knife, rolling away as the creature swiped at the air where I'd just been. Desperation fueled me. I scrambled backwards, the creature advancing, its shriek echoing through the trees. Then, I hit something solid. The lake. Nowhere left to run. I was backed against the lake, the cold water lapping at my boots. The creature stalked closer, its twisted skull tilted to the side, as if savoring the moment. My heart jackhammered in my chest, this was it, a Langley-shaped stain on the Montana wilderness. But damn it, I wasn't going down without a fight. With a roar, I lunged forward, not at the creature, but past it. My only chance was the water. I splashed into the icy depths, the shock momentarily taking my breath away. I heard a furious howl behind me, the swish of its claws cutting through the air as it swiped at my retreating form. The lake was a blessing and a curse. The murky water obscured my movement, but the biting cold sapped my strength with each stroke. I kept my eyes on the far shore, the dense tree line a promise of temporary safety. The creature, surprisingly, didn't follow. It paced the shoreline, its shrieks echoing across the water, a chilling soundtrack to my desperate swim. Reaching the opposite shore felt like a miracle. I collapsed on the muddy bank, gasping for air, my limbs like lead weights. But there was no time to rest. I staggered into the woods, half crawling, half stumbling, driven by the primal need to put distance between myself and that monstrous thing. My lungs burned, my muscles screamed, but I kept going, fueled by adrenaline and rising terror. By the time the first tendrils of dawn painted the sky, I was miles deep in the wilderness, lost and exhausted. Found an outcropping of rock, a sheltered spot where I could collapse and try to patch up the worst of the gashes the creature had given me. As I fumbled with the makeshift bandages, a wave of bleak hopelessness washed over me. I was alone, injured, in the heart of hostile territory with something inhuman on my trail. Days blurred together. I survived on wild berries, rainwater, and sheer bloody-minded stubbornness. My dreams were fevered nightmares filled with claws, glowing eyes, and the echoing shrieks of the Wendigo. With each passing hour, the conviction grew that this was where I'd die. Not in some heroic firefight or clandestine op, but torn apart and devoured by a creature straight out of a horror story. Then, on the fifth day, a flicker of movement caught my eye. Not the sinuous creep of the creature, but the purposeful stride of humans. Hunters, two burly guys in camo, rifles slung over their shoulders. Salvation. I stumbled out of my hiding spot, probably looking more feral than human. Help, I croaked, my voice barely above a whisper. The hunters startled, raising their rifles. Easy there, one said, lowering his weapon cautiously. You lost, mister. I wanted to laugh, to weep, to scream. Instead, I managed to get out a few strangled words about being attacked, about something out there. They exchanged uneasy glances. Listen, the other hunter said, his eyes narrowed. We know something ain't right in those woods. Folks gone missing, strange tracks. He hesitated, then gestured vaguely. But whatever you saw, best you forget it. City folk like you don't belong here. There was a hint of threat in his voice now, not friendly concern. I knew then there'd be no rescue, no official investigation. 
the locals, they knew enough to fear what lurked in the shadows. And they wanted to keep it that way, their dark secret safe from the prying eyes of the outside world. They helped me bandage my wounds, gave me some supplies, then pointed me roughly in the direction of civilization. As I limped away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't just leaving something behind, I was being forced out ejected from a place where the lines of reality were blurred and ancient evils lingered. Back in the real world, the aftermath was just as I feared. Debriefing was a tense affair, filled with skeptical frowns and thinly veiled accusations that I had cracked under pressure. My report was heavily redacted, the Wendigo dismissed as hallucinations caused by exhaustion and stress. They offered me a desk job, early retirement with full benefits, a thinly veiled bribe to shut up and disappear. I didn't take it. Couldn't. Instead, I vanished into the sprawling anonymity of a big city, another face in the endless crowd. Got a dead-end job, a dingy apartment, spent my nights hunched over maps of Montana, Marking sightings of the Wendigo gleaned from obscure local news reports, whispered internet tales. Some nights, I think I hear it. Distant shrieks carried on the wind, echoing through the concrete canyons. Maybe it's just my shattered mind playing tricks. Maybe not. The Wendigo took something from me that day at the lake, not just physical scars but something deeper. Peace of mind, the certainty of what is and isn't real. Folks think monsters only exist in stories. I know better. And out there, in the forgotten corners of the wilderness, something ancient and hungry still waits. Let me tell you about those Pine Barrens in Jersey. Folks think it's just scrubland, maybe some mobsters dumping bodies where nobody will find them. Truth is, there's something older hiding in the shadows of those twisted pines. Locals know bits and pieces, whisper tales about the Jersey Devil and lights flickering in the deep woods. Call me Tanner, and I've been with the agency long enough that campfire stories don't scare me much. Or well, they didn't. Thing is, we got wind of strange happenings near a hush-hush military base nestled in the barrens. Supposed sightings, livestock mutilated, the kind of stuff that'd usually get filed under crackpot ramblings, only this time there was hard evidence. Security footage, blurry, grainy, but something moving just outside the base perimeter something wrong so they sent me figured a routine investigation wouldn't spook the higher-ups so much packed the usual gear plus a few extras off the unofficial company checklist motion sensor cameras the fancy heat signature kind and blessed silver for good measure Gotta love a job where thoroughness includes prepping for werewolves and demons. Spent the first few nights trekking into the dense pines, that oppressive quiet settling over me like a shroud. It ain't normal, that kind of silence. No crickets, no frogs, just the pounding of my own heart in my ears and the rustle of leaves that might have been the wind, or might have been something else. First hit came on the third night. One of the motion sensors went off, its red light blinking frantically in the darkness. Camera was ripped apart, the lens shattered. Found tracks the next morning, unlike any damn animal I'd ever seen. Too big for a dog, the gate all wrong for a bear. In the claws, Jesus like knives had been raked through the soft earth. Don't go in there alone, son, the old gas station attendant had warned, 
his roomy eyes filled with a fear that put my training honed skepticism on edge. Reckon I should have listened. Tracking the creature was its own kind of hell. That thing knew the woods better than any human alive. I'd find the occasional chilling clue, a scrap of fur snagged on a branch, the stench of something rotten and feral hanging in the air. And always, the feeling of being watched, of being stalked by a predator far savvier than me. Then came the night the trap almost snapped shut. Found a hollow, half sheltered by a gnarled old oak, and in it, half devoured deer carcass. Perfect spot for an ambush. Hunkered down under that damn tree as the sun dipped below the horizon, the shadows twisting into horrifying shapes. The agency taught me patience, that uneasy sense of waiting for the other shoe to drop you get on ops. Never felt it like that night. Then I saw it. Hulking silhouette hunched over its gruesome meal, pale moonlight glinting off what looked like scales. Not fur, not feathers, scales, glistening with an oily sheen. Its head, that's where the nightmares start. Elongated, with a snout filled with jagged teeth, and eyes, glowing with a cold, malevolent light. Before I could get a clean shot, the thing was gone. Melted into the underbrush with impossible speed, leaving nothing but the mangled deer and the lingering stench of sulfur and rot. Shaking like a damn leaf, I stumbled back to the pickup, radioed for backup that never came, signal scrambled, like something was jamming it. Reckon it's common knowledge in these parts, outsider poking his nose into the darkness ain't getting help from no government types. I'm not running. Not yet. Set up a makeshift camp in an abandoned hunting cabin, rigged the perimeter with every bit of tech I salvaged before the signal died completely. I know it's out there, watching, waiting. The locals were right, this is old, old evil lurking in the heart of the woods, and I might just have pissed it off enough to bring it right to my doorstep. That night in the cabin was pure hell. The flimsy wooden walls felt like tissue paper against the malevolence that thrummed just outside the dim circle of my flashlight beam. Strange noises echoed through the barrens, inhuman howls intermingled with a skittering, shuffling sound, like claws against rotting wood. Every creak of the floorboards had me jerking my rifle up, heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. Sleep was a distant memory, replaced by the stark terror of a man hopelessly outmatched. If I close my eyes, I can still hear that scratching whisper outside the window, like the creature was trying to find a way in, toying with me. Dawn brought no relief. The siege continued, a psychological game of attrition, wearing away at my nerves. I knew leaving the cabin meant almost certain death, but the crushing claustrophobia was getting to me. Had to move, had to do something, or I'd crack. By noon, I'd formulated a desperate plan. One of the locals had told me legends of iron repelling the Jersey Devil, old wives' tales, probably. But what choice did I have? Using the cabin's rusty fireplace tools, I hammered out crude spikes, a makeshift perimeter against the unholy. It was pathetic, flimsy, and reeked of desperation. But it was all I had. Come nightfall, the cabin was ringed with the iron spikes. I huddled in the center, rifle loaded, every sense straining against the oppressive silence. Then... The howling began again, close to this time, circling the cabin. And there, illuminated by the sickly moon, it stood. The Jersey Devil in its grotesque glory. The scales were a mottled black and gray, reptilian, speckled with what looked almost like rust in the moonlight. 
Its wings were folded against its back, vestigial and leathery, but the claws on the spindly limbs were the size of butcher knives. But it was the head that haunted me, that inhuman skull, and the eyes, burning like embers. It paced in front of my makeshift barrier, not attacking, just sizing me up. With a shriek that set my teeth on edge, it lunged, raking its claws across the iron spikes. The sound was horrific, metal screeching against bone. It recoiled, hissing, but the barrier held. For hours, the dance continued. It would test the boundary, howling its frustration, and I'd wait, drenched in cold sweat, praying those flimsy spikes were enough. Then, just as sudden as it started, the attack ceased. The creature slinked back into the woods, leaving behind an echoing silence. Dawn broke, gray and somber, painting the bloodstains marking the iron barrier. I waited hours more before finally venturing out, the rifle clutched tight enough to turn my knuckles white. No sign of the creature, just the lingering stench of death and decay. The aftermath was the hardest part. Back at HQ, I found myself facing a different kind of horror. Debrief was a nightmare. I stumbled through the report, trying to explain the Jersey Devil, the scales, the glowing eyes. The skeptical stares, the nudges and whispers of battle fatigue or substance abuse were like a knife to the gut. The official report was a masterpiece of whitewashing, citing unexplained animal attack and possible hallucinatory state. My career was in tatters, built on a foundation that nobody believed. Turns out, monsters are easy to fight. It's the disbelief that gets you in the end. I'm still with the agency though desk jockey is a more accurate description than field operative these days. Sometimes, after a late shift, I catch the scent of damp pine needles and rotting leaves clinging to my suit, the phantom echo of those desolate woods. And every night, I skin the rooftops and shadows outside my apartment window, almost expecting to see those glowing eyes staring back. People talk about closure, about moving on after something like that. They don't understand. I saw something out there in the barrens, something that shattered my understanding of the world, and there's no fixing that. I survived the Jersey Devil, but it left its mark. I'm living proof that sometimes, the real horror isn't the monster itself, it's the knowledge that the things lurking in the darkness are all too real and nobody will ever believe you. Sometimes, the aftermath is a fate worse than death. I'd face that creature again in a heartbeat, rather than live the rest of my days trapped between a truth I can't tell and a world that thinks I'm insane. Let me tell you about the caves out in Death Valley. Everyone gets hot and bothered about Area 51, like that's where the real secrets are, but the real weirdness, the stuff that'll turn your hair white, that's way down below, not up in the sky. Call me Randall, been in the agency business since dinosaurs roamed the earth, seen my share of things man wasn't meant to know. This op started out routine, well, routine for this crazy life, at least. Reports of tremors, missing hikers, the usual spiel that means some poor geology nerds are about to be very, very wrong about what they're studying. Me? I'm sent to make sure things stay under wraps, the official story fits neatly into some textbook. Death Valley's hot, everyone knows that. But this, this was like the desert was breathing, a dry, burning exhale straight from hell. Brought a specialized recon team with me, guys who don't flinch at the dark and the unknown. Caving expedition gone wrong, 
a cover so old it's practically see-through, Griffin joked, him being the closest thing to sunshine and optimism on that team. The first few hours were uneventful, almost boring. Standard cave system, narrow passages, stale air, enough to explain how a bunch of spelunkers could get themselves lost. It was the smell that hit us first. Not decay, like some poor critter crawled off to die, but something, older. Acrid, sulfuric, making the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. Then, the noises began. Not the echoes or dripping water you expect in a cave, but soft, skittering sounds, like claws scrabbling over stone. The guys were getting antsy, flashlights cutting through the gloom. Just rats, man, Keller muttered, but even he didn't sound convinced. That's when the ground started to shake. Just a rumble at first, then violent enough to pitch us off our feet. Rockfall echoed above us, sealing off the way we came. One of the newbies panicked, firing off his gun into the darkness, stupid damn move, but what's done is done. Silence fell, absolute and suffocating, broken only by the pounding of our own hearts. Then Griffin screamed, his voice swallowed whole by the abyss. I whirled around, flashlight beam landing on, nothing. Griff was just gone, vanished without a trace. Griff? Griffin? Keller was edging backwards, his face pale under the harsh lights. I knew the look. Guy had lost his bottle. Can't blame him, not with whatever the hell we were dealing with down here. We found what was left of Griffin further on. Not much, just scraps of gear smeared with blood and something else. Slimy, glistening, like the damn thing had half digested him before spitting out the remains. It was Keller who spotted the creature first. Perched on a ledge high above us, a silhouette against the darkness. Hulking, segmented thing, like a cross between a centipede and a lizard, only way bigger than anything nature ever intended. Its eyes, they shone dull red in the weak light, reflecting back our terror. Thing was toying with us, I realized. Circling, letting us catch glimpses of its segmented body, its long, whip-like tail. The stench was overpowering now, making me gag. With a shriek that peeled away the last bits of my sanity, the creature lunged. I fired off a few shots, more out of desperation than hope, but it retreated with uncanny speed, disappearing back into the shadows. We ran then blindly, instinct taking over. The cave was a maze, every twist and turn seeming to lead us deeper into the belly of the earth. Behind us, the skittering echoed closer, the creature stalking us through its domain. Ours morphed into an eternity of stumbling through that subterranean labyrinth. We lost track of time, our flashlights feeble candles against the monstrous darkness. Keller babbled incoherently, his remaining sanity crumbling away. I held on to mine by a thread, the old field agent discipline kicking back in. We had to find a way out, had to survive. The creature was strategic. It harried us, hurting us like livestock. We caught glimpses, flashes of its segmented body slithering past the rustle echoing in the silence, those unnerving red eyes gleaming from unseen crevices. Fear and claustrophobia tightened around me like a noose. I knew we weren't going to get out of this in one piece, if at all. A faint glimmer up ahead broke through my despair. Was it a trick of the light, or... Up there, I croaked pointing a shaking finger at what appeared to be an opening on a higher ledge. A way out, or another dead end. 
we didn't have a choice. Frantically, we scrambled up, half climbing, half dragging ourselves towards the sliver of hope. We emerged into a vast, cavernous chamber. It was dimly illuminated by a strange luminescence, some sort of bioluminescence on the cave walls. And there, coiled in the center, like the monstrous heart of this subterranean hell, was the creature. It was huge, easily the size of a bus. Its exoskeleton gleamed with a repulsive oily sheen, and its tail twitched menacingly. Worse were the piles of things around it. Bits of clothing, shattered equipment, and gnawed bones, human bones. This lair was its feeding ground, and we were the next course on the menu. Keller whimpered, his gaze fixed on the skeletal remains. The fight was gone from him, broken by the grim reality of our situation. But the creature made a fatal mistake, it was focused on Keller, on the easy prey. It didn't see me slip one of the high-yield phosphorus grenades off my belt. Survival sometimes boils down to who's willing to get their hands dirtiest. Hey, ugly. I yelled, my voice rough. I lobbed the grenade as hard as I could, aiming for its gaping maw. The creature reared back in surprise, a screech echoing off the cavern walls. The grenade exploded, engulfing the creature in white-hot fire. It thrashed blindly, its segmented body flailing in agony. The smell of burning flesh filled the air, a nauseating counterpoint to the creature's death throes. Taking advantage of the chaos, I grabbed Keller. Move! I hauled him towards the same opening we'd crawled through, the adrenaline of desperation giving me unnatural strength. Behind us, the cavern echoed with the creature's pain shrieks. We made it back to the twisting passages, blindly running through the labyrinth, driven by the primal need to escape. Behind us, the creature's cries were growing fainter, but I knew it wasn't over. We were wounded prey, leaving a trail of blood and fear. It would follow. The aftermath is a blur. We stumbled from the cave system as dawn painted the Death Valley with streaks of bleak light. No sign of the creature, for now. Rescue arrived, more agency folks, the cleanup crew who sanitized the world of inconvenient truths. Keller poor bastard is in an institution. Ravings about monsters below, nobody believes him except me. The official report cited a previously undiscovered cavern collapse, textbook stuff. But they don't know, none of them truly understand what lurks beneath the skin of our world. Sometimes, the monsters aren't found in distant stars or dusty old legends. They're born and bred in the cold, desolate heart of the earth, waiting for the unlucky ones who stumble into their path. The Death Valley incident gnaws at me, a lingering poison. Got some scars, new ones deeper than any blade could carve. They want me to debrief, talk it out with some psych who thinks trauma can be neatly dissected and filed away. I just clench my jaw and nod along play their game, keep them comfortable in their ignorance. Some nights I dream of that cavern, those glowing red eyes, and the smell of sulfur. I wake up in a cold sweat, convinced I can still hear the skittering echoes of claws on stone. I keep a phosphorus grenade close, tucked away against the chill certainty that one day, the creature will come hunting for the one who escaped, the one who dared to fight back and I'll be ready. Let me tell you, those Black Hills in South Dakota always gave me the creeps. There's something ancient lurking in those woods, something that whispers of a time before cell phones and classified briefings. 
Call me Hayes. Been with the agency so long my own mama wouldn't recognize me if I passed her on the street. We were tracking some chatter, domestic extremist groups, the usual backwoods militia with too much ammo and too little common sense. I was mostly there for babysitting duty, making sure these paranoid fellas didn't do nothing too stupid out in the middle of nowhere. Then, folks started disappearing. Hikers, locals, even one of our surveillance units vanished without a trace. No bodies, no signs of struggle, just, gone. The locals muttered old legends about the Wachapi. They weren't forthcoming with details, a lot of sideways glances and hushed stories about things that walk on two legs, but ain't men. The militia boys were spooked too, blaming the disappearances on shadowy government conspiracies. You know the type. I'm a man who trusts his gut, and mine was twisting itself into knots. Whatever was out there, it wasn't some delusional survivalists or black ops gone rogue. This felt different, primal. That night, I geared up. Standard issue kit, plus a few, extras. Silver ammo old hunter's trick, worth a try if those legends held a grain of truth. A wicked-looking machete stashed in my pack, never underestimate the value of cold steel. Spent the next few days tracking, following a hunch more than any hard evidence. The deeper I ventured into those woods, the more the shadows seemed to cling. Felt like I was being watched, every rustle of leaves setting my nerves on edge. Found one of the militia camps, abandoned in a hurry. Graffiti scrawled in frantic letters, IT sees all, IT hunts all. Yeah, not exactly comforting. By nightfall, I was deep in the heart of the woods, miles from civilization. It was there I saw it for the first time. A hulking shape, silhouetted against the pale moonlight, moving through the trees with unnerving grace. Too tall, too lean to be human. And those eyes, they glowed in the darkness, twin embers promising nothing but pain. I fired off a few shots, more out of desperation than hope. The creature, the Wachapi, or whatever the hell it was, let out a shriek that seemed to pierce my very soul. It vanished into the undergrowth with impossible speed. My flashlight beam cut through the woods, revealing nothing but empty silence. For the rest of the night, it was a twisted game of cat and mouse. The Wachapi stalked me, its presence a constant, oppressive weight in the darkness. I caught glimpses of it, leathery, mottled skin stretched over a skeletal frame, a long snout filled with wicked teeth. Those eyes burned with a chilling, malevolent intelligence that made my blood run cold. I stumbled deeper into the woods, half running, half crawling, every instinct screaming at me to get out. The Wachapi was playing with me, hurting me, driving me further from any hope of salvation. And all the while, those shrieks echoed around me, a symphony of terror promising a gruesome end. Finally, exhausted and drenched in sweat, I burst from the tree line, emerging into a moonlit clearing. In the center, an abandoned hunter's cabin, maybe a chance, a sanctuary, if I could just. Then the Wachapi stepped out of the shadows. It was massive, easily eight feet tall, its skeletal form draped in a patchwork of fur and skin that shifted with unnatural fluidity. I raised my rifle, firing off rounds that ripped through the night. The creature staggered, a guttural snarl escaping its elongated jaws. I was nearly out of ammo, and it was closing the distance fast, its shrieks intensifying. Frantically, I drew the machete, more a gesture of defiance than a real weapon. The creature lunged, and I... 
I closed my eyes, bracing myself for the killing blow that never came. Opening them, heart pounding like a rabbit caught in a snare, I saw why. The Wachapi lay sprawled on the ground, a single silver bullet lodged in its skull. Its glowing eyes had gone dark, the unnatural energy that had animated it, snuffed out. Behind the creature stood a figure I hardly recognized. Jeremiah, one of the local hunters the agency had written off as a harmless old mountain man. In his weathered hands, he held an ancient-looking rifle, wisps of smoke curling from the barrel. Thought you could use some help, son, he rasped, a flicker of something like sympathy in his flinty eyes. Them legends are true for a reason. With agonizing slowness, the Wachapi's corpse began to dissolve. Where solid flesh had been moments ago, only wisps of acrid smoke and a greasy black residue remained. Been hunting them things longer and you've been alive, Jeremiah continued, reloading his weapon with practiced ease. Filthy creatures crawled up from some hell pit to torment good folks. He gestured around the clearing. It was drawn to you, to the fear and the anger. Feeds on it, makes it stronger. The rest of the night was a blur. Jeremiah led me back to what passed for civilization in those parts, regaling me with tales that chilled my blood even more than the encounter with the Wachapi itself. His family, he said had been keepers of this land for generations, bound by an old pact to defend against the darkness that clung to the Black Hills. Turns out, while I'd been tracking conspiracy theorists, I'd been missing the real story, the timeless battle waged in the forgotten corners of the world. The official incident report, the one filed with the agency, cited a bear attack, freak accident. The locals, they knew enough to keep their mouths shut. Jeremiah was, in his way, a sort of unofficial field agent, the barrier between those woods and what passed for normalcy. But what happened out there in those woods changed me. I'm still with the agency, pushing papers and attending sterile briefings in bland conference rooms. Some nights, though, I dream of the Black Hills, of skeletal shapes and glowing eyes. Dream of that chilling shriek and the feel of cold steel in my sweating hand. I see Jeremiah's weathered face, etched with the weight of a secret war fought just beyond the edge of our awareness. In the aftermath, a lingering unease clung to me. See, the thing about fighting monsters is, you start to see them everywhere. They hide in the shadows cast by flickering streetlights, in the paranoid ramblings of extremists, in the cold bureaucratic machinery of the organizations you swore to serve. That primal fear, the hunter's instinct that something lurks just beyond the edge of sight, that doesn't just go away. Sometimes, late at night, I open my laptop, start a document that will never be filed. I hesitate over the blinking cursor, then type a single sentence, subject, Black Hills Anomaly Report. Then, I delete the words, one by one. It's too dangerous, too unbelievable. Jeremiah was right, some things are better left alone, buried beneath layers of lies and convenient explanations. I think back to that clearing in the woods to the steaming pile of unholy residue that was once the Wachapi. The creature itself might be gone, but the questions it raised, the chilling implications, linger. How many other creatures stalk the forgotten corners of our world? How many unseen guardians fight their lonely battles against the encroaching darkness? The agency deals in verifiable threats the quantifiable dangers presented by hostile nations and extremist groups. But out there, in the ancient forests and desolate mountain ranges, 
another reality exists, one where the line between myth and nightmare blurs. The tragic aftermath isn't some neatly concluded report. It's the knowledge that the true threat might never be fully comprehended, never truly defeated. It's the haunting realization that the monsters we should fear the most may be the ones we never see. Sometimes, ignorance isn't just bliss. It's survival.